started here. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, my name is Marty Stratton. I'm the executive producer of Doom at id Software. Um, and uh, welcome to Uncapped, Doom and the Power of IdTech 6. Thank you for being here. I think this is our first panel of QuakeCon. So uh, really appreciate you being here, being at QuakeCon and, and uh, coming to this panel. Uh, as, as people were walking in, I actually noticed a bunch of, uh, a bunch of id people as well. So actually, I want to start off by maybe having having the team that, that, that came to, to see this. I, I know everybody hopefully loves Doom and, and has had a lot of fun, but uh, there's a lot of guys, if you're standing, wave your hand. If you're sitting, maybe stand up and you can say, say congratulations to the team. We, uh, we have a great team at it, and, and it's, it's fun for us to get up and be able to, uh, to represent the team uh, in, in this fashion. Um, so I know everybody is, is uh, here is, is probably you know, very technical, really into the, the, the technical bits of, of gaming and technology and hardware. Uh, so we'll, we'll get into a really, uh, really good deep dive on, on that stuff. Um, but uh, actually, before we, we get started on that, I'd like to just kind of maybe start at the end there with, with Robert and, and have you guys go down and, and just introduce yourself Tell us a little bit about what you do and, and maybe give a, a little bit of, of uh, now that we're done with the project, a little kind of anecdote of, of maybe what you, something, your, your favorite thing that, that uh, we accomplished or that you accomplished, um, you know, particularly related to the, to the tech. I'm Robert Duffy. Um, I'm the uh, CEO, or the not CEO. Off on. Sometimes he thinks sometimes. He's the CEO. Sometimes I do. <laughs> Is it working? Is his microphone on? Light shift. No. There we go. I'm Robert Duffy. I'm the CTO at ID. Um, I've been at ID for about 17 years, I think. Um, long time, and I think uh, probably on this project, what I enjoyed the most and I think what I'm proudest of was just how the entire team, uh, both from a technology standpoint and a creative standpoint, worked together and, and produced what we felt was a, was a really, really good, solid game. Um, you know, performance is, is, a, is a cornerstone of what we do. Uh, but performance takes both technology and, you know, it's a team effort. It's not just a bunch of programmers making stuff go fast. So I think the way we came together, run at these super fast frame rates, that's what did it for me. Uncapped frame rate. Uncapped. <laughs> Hi, guys. Um, <laughs> my name is Shell Williams. I'm the technical specialist at ID. Um, the thing that I'm most proud of is when we had the E3 Doom gameplay reveal, and I was given these two maps to play, and I had to figure out the best way to show everything about Doom in those two maps to the whole world. And probably what I'm more proud of, other than playing those, was when we got back to the office after E3, the whole team was diving into the web forums and online and reading comments from fans and we took those suggestions and we implemented and tweaked the game to put that into final gameplay. So that was cool. Yeah. This is work. D don't worry about managing, just that's turn right. <laughs> Hi, I'm, uh, wow, that's pretty loud. <laughs> Hi guys, I'm Billy Khan. I'm the lead project programmer on Doom and Tech 6. And I think, uh, the most impressive or most thing I'm most proud of is we, we really enjoy making GPUs melt. So, um, <laughs> and what I mean by that is like, um, we tried to really push the boundaries on all the platforms that we shipped on. Um, we wanted to make sure that we really, uh, we didn't like uh, sacrifice uh, either, you know, putting lower quality on, on, on one platform. We really tried to push each platform to its fullest and make sure that it ran as best as it could with the highest fidelity visuals that we could make. And um, you know what we ended up with is something that's that's usually unheard of. We are we really make full usage of the GPU almost 9900% of the time, and we're ALU bound, which is something that you know as a is very uncommon when we make games. Uh, we usually most games are bandwidth bound. So um, when people talk on the forums and say, "Oh, my PS4 or oh, my PCs, like what, the fans are going crazy," we actually think that's very cool because what it means is there like there's no latency. The, the GPU is really used the entire time. Um, so, and, and one, one other thing I think, I've, if you noticed our progression from, from our first reveal in QuakeCon 14 that was behind doors for you guys, um, if you look back and all the stuff you presented each time as we progressed, you made leaps and bound improvements as far as performance and visuals and just general improvements based on feedback from the reaction from the crowd as, and as well as we played the game. So I think 
uh, even now, I mean, even post ship, if you look at if you look at the stuff that's not coming out of DLC, uh, the visuals that we be able to push on the, on the new maps, or even the stuff if you just did with Vulcan, I think uh, I think we continuously try to push the boundaries. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Thiago Souza. Um, I'm the lead render programmer. So uh, essentially, what that means, I essentially just make pretty pixels. In a sense. <laughs> <laughs> really pretty pixels. And fast, of course. So they need to run fast on every GPU and hardware configuration that we try to aim for. Uh, so the thing I'm mostly proud of is that uh, I would say how quick we iterated. So uh, I would say most of the engine stuff, the render side, was like done in less than two years. So that's actually a big achievement in my particular point of view. Uh, so having to refactor a ton of things so that uh, everything looks as nice as possible and still runs at six hertz or even higher frame rates. Um, and in the end, also like assembling a new team in a way. Uh, so a lot of the, the the rendering technology and the rendering team was assembled uh, during these two years. Uh, so I think that's fairly impressive, I have to say, particularly given my past almost 15 years of experience on the industry. Um, so that's it. Yeah, uh, I think uh, you know you, you you hit on something there. Like we we did assemble a, a team uh, kind of over the course of of development. Uh, we we, we kind of iterated on the tech very very quickly. Uh, we have very talented people uh, with with lots of different experiences and and. Uh, uh, and, and ways of looking at things. One thing I'm always asked about on the creative side is, is kind of managing the, the vision of the, of the game and the, you know, like the creativity, how do you keep a focus on that? What would, maybe, again, maybe starting with Robert or Billy here, uh, how, how would you characterize kind of the, the vision for id Tech 6 uh, as, we, as we developed it? And, and um, was that, do you feel like that's different? I mean, Robert, you've been here a long time, so do you feel like that's different than than past uh, technologies that, that we've done? Yeah, it definitely has been. I think the um, uh, historically uh, it did, we've kind of built a technology and then we, we designed a game around that technology and uh, this time around uh, we really wanted to, to we knew what, what kind of a Doom game we wanted to make um, and we really worked hard to, 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 to work on, on getting the teams to work together and building the technology around kind of the dy we knew we wanted dynamic lighting back and a lot of, a lot of dy dynamics in the world from a rendering perspective. Um, but our, you know, our key goal has always been, you know, at least 60 hertz. Uh, we wanted to do better visuals than other games are doing at 30 hertz. Uh, generally speaking, I think, I think we've succeeded in these, in, in, in these goals and, uh, but it really is about, you know, player movement is key for us and, and you've got to be at 60 hertz to, 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 to get the kind of feel you get from an id game. And I think just the marriage of, of the tech and, and the creative process has been big. What do you, what do you, Billy, uh, as far as uh, your perspective, you've also been, you, you've been here through the development of, of most of id Tech 5 and, 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 and seen that. Uh, you know, how, how would you, uh, again, you, when, you get, when you get people coming together from, from very disparate backgrounds, you, you, you want to you, you know, try to have that common, common goal for, for you and, and you know, leading, uh, leading the team as well. Uh, what, what, what are kind of the things that you preach uh, and, 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 and the approach that you take? Um, I think we have to stay true to uh, it. What we've always done in it, uh, it software is we try to push the boundaries. And uh, one of the things that we did really well on this project, I think, is have that relationship that Duffy was talking about, which is that symbiotic relationship between um, art and design and programming, and making tech that really makes the game stand out. Not just make a tech demo and then make the game afterwards, but this time we, we looked at what, the, what, what, we, what we felt was a Doom game in, in current modern times, and we really would bring that to life, you know, bring that comic book style, high visual, high fast paced action uh, to the forefront with amazing graphics. Um, and then, you know, in a big portion of that is also like, you know, full, going really, really fast from a, from a, uh, from a, a rendering standpoint. So, um, Having, but you can't do that just on tech. So you know, sometimes you just you know you make content and then you try to optimize it. I think the approach we took this time, which was you know we got art involved, we got design involved, we got we got the tech group involved, and like we really sat down and said you know what are the things that we need to focus on, 
uh, may it be the gore system, may it be the melee system, may it be you know pathing, or even um, how how does the guy look like when he explodes? Like what kind of particles do you want on the screen for that? Um, making sure that we had all the necessary tools available so the so the content creators and the, and the design team and the artists could really realize the vision in our head but make it run super, super fast. Because when you have a game that runs super, super fast, it, it, it takes it to the next level. Um, it's something you can't, you have to feel. Um, I'm sure a lot of you guys are probably playing 144 hertz monitors out there and, and that's very important to us. Um, so having having the group of uh, all the uh, all the parts of the of the development team working together was crucial because um, we asked the artists multiple times to redo the textures. We asked the artists to optimize their meshes. We asked the artists to think about how uh, we asked the designers to think about their um, how, how how the gameplay would work out. So and, and I think the, the the biggest thing was having that close communication loop. And working together, that really stood out, as well as having a, you know an awesome team. I, I, uh, it, I, I was on vacation last week, and I, I read a book uh, that uh, Eric Carell, our marketing manager, uh, recommended called "Go Like Hell." It's about like back in the early '60s, the race between uh, Ford and Ferrari uh, to to create to to win the Tour Tour Le Mans in in uh, in France, I guess. Um, and uh, it reminded me so much of like when you when you when you read about like the way Ferrari approached their development, or or even Ford to to a certain extent, but more, a little bit more so Ferrari because it's very boutique. Uh, it reminded me so much of of kind of like what what you guys do from a uh, you know from a just pushing the pushing the envelope perspective. You know, you're you're Tiago joined us about a year two years ago or so two years ago. Um, how uh, and, and you, you came from Crytek, slightly larger. How, how has things, um, from a day-to-day -day perspective, for for you, um, how do you how do you approach uh, you know being at ID uh, has has you know you know jumping in and like you said really transforming the the, the render over a couple of years. Um, kind of what, what was what was your day-to-day -day like and 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 kind of the, the the pressures or or even just the opportunities that you felt um, once you once you landed here. Uh, I mean, essentially, we started by uh, evaluating what was what would we had at that point. Uh, I started by evaluating all of the, the technology and all of the code, and uh, okay, what can we improve, uh, especially for the art team? How can they work faster? How can they achieve nicer visuals in a more consistent way without having to redo assets so often? Although, with the change for PBR, of course, they had to learn a lot in the process to make uh, assets in a consistent uh, way, essentially. Then it was also trying to help designing the technology so that, the, uh, for example, the, on the tool side, it would be more efficient for the art team to, let's say, detail the worlds or uh, try to achieve nicer and consistent results uh, more easily instead of having to wait, uh, I don't know, like eight hours until they can iterate on something. So essentially, the workflow is it's key for achieving visuals. Um, then there's of course the more geeky part of it. So how do we design something so that it runs, so that we achieve this nice quality and performance ratio? So you cannot just go to one end and just make everything running super pretty and super, uh, let's say, very technology technology heavy, uh, because then you have a kind of a slideshow in the end. Okay. Uh, and then you can also just go for performance, and then everything runs super fast. But then it looks not so interesting. So it needs to be a balance of uh, such kind of things. And that, I mean, has a several implications. So it's not just, of course, code as a, uh, creates a foundation so that the art team can achieve their own vision. So, um, so things like lightning, uh, having a nice color reproduction, so on, tone mapping and stuff like that. And there was a, a huge amount of catch up, let's say, like this, so that we can reach this kind of uh, next gen visuals uh, across all of the platforms that we had to support in an efficient way. So at six yards, uh, which is, uh, Actually, even more than six yards. So, um, yeah. Yeah, uh, you mentioned um, you know the, the transition to, to PBR rendering. Um, uh, I'm sure everybody knows what that is to, to some extent. Um, but uh, <clears throat> that was that that was a massive uh, a massive step in the course of development. One of those one of those moments of like, oh my god, that the, the game went from 
hey, that looks pretty. It was actually after, it was right after QuakeCon uh, 2014, I think, that, that we made that, um, made that leap. Um, and, and, you know, that was, that was kind of like that first big step from IdTech 5 to IdTech 6. Uh, you know, talk, talk a little bit about, you know, kind of the decision to do that and, and, um, and even the, so, so kind of the, the why and then the, the, the ramifications, because we did end up, uh, we, I know we have some artists here that, that, that did have to go back and, and redo a, a, a lot of stuff. What, you know, maybe again, Billy and Robert, you can, you can address that. Um, well, the, the, the goal to go to PBR was, you know, it was not only to make it look much better and more realistic, it's also to make, uh, make it easier for the artists to have consistent results. Um, going physically based allows us to uh, ensure, for the most part, that the art that the artist creates does not have to be baked for a certain situation. So it looks always good um, within a certain lighting scheme across all maps uh, prior to going PBR. Many times you'd have to tweak your art specifically for, your, for a certain level, and then um, you spend a lot of time, and then you, consistency is, uh, is a problem. So PBR, um, at the first, there's a nice switch to that. There's some learning curve there, but once, once you understand the fundamentals, I think uh, it actually speeds up production and also allows us to make much more, and focus on what's important, making kick-ass art and making the game awesome. Um, it, um, one of the stumbles that we had is like we also on top of that we wanted to go um, you know we wanted to gamma correct our, our art pipeline and um, you know to do that it was painful because usually traditionally uh, that means calibrating your monitors making sure you know uh, everything is um, s solid and it looks right but that that takes a steep learning curve we actually had some stumbles of that where we tried to gamma correct too many things and looking back at that was probably a mistake but the artist stuck through it and read the textures multiple times for us. And I think, um, you know, props to Lear and the guys to, to really hang in there and stick with us because I think the end result really shows um, that making that choice was uh, the right choice. And we need to have dynamic lights. Doom requires dynamic lighting. It requires, um, it requires um, the world to be, you know, full of blood and looking nasty and we really need specularity in our surfaces. We need to be able to show uh, the sheen and, and, and the, 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 the Mars station, for example, it requires a lot of metallic. So going with GGX uh, for, for our BRDF was uh, a natural choice. What do you think, Duffy? I think the artist hoped that we uh, avoid the time when they redid all the textures. <laughs> and then about two days later, uh, we were like, hey, uh, guys, uh, there was this bug, and you're going to have to do all that one more time. <laughs> so. we, have, we have very, very nice understanding artists who, who worked a lot of overtime. So, I mean, same thing. I, I can also elaborate a little bit more on that side. So, uh, I mean, PBR is, there is a lot of, of course, mathematical foundation. So making sure everything's proper from a code perspective. Uh, but also for the art side, I think it's a really nice workflow for them. So instead of each artist making their own little texture in vacuum, working with their own little style, I mean, that's good in a sense. Uh, if every artist works that way with their own little style and different, uh, let's say, texture inputs, you end up with this big soup of results and inconsistency. So from a physical perspective, uh, Essentially, I see it as a workflow for the art team to work in a consistent manner. So they create textures, let's say, they paint how does metal uh, behave, how does plastic behave, how does blood behave. So essentially, all of this is driven by a physical, um, let's say, a physical approach and not just a random, okay, maybe this is this, that color, that color. So it's, essentially, it's much more easy, I think, for the art team in the end. So, uh, yeah, definitely. It was, it, was a, it was a kind of a stunning turn for us. Um, Shale, I think you it's you, you have you're you're kind of interesting because and I, you're probably actually a lot like a lot of maybe some people in this room where you're technical, very interested in tech, uh, very analytical, but not necessarily a programmer. You know, by background, it gives you a, a kind of this. Um, and and you've you've been at the company a long time. You've worked with Robert uh, a long time. Uh, and, and you've, you've kind of taken on this role of part analyst, part firefighter, um, you know, part problem solver. You know, you'll, you'll, you'll kind of dig in when, when, honestly, a lot of people can't figure out a bug. You've been around long enough and understand the technology well enough to dive in and, and find it. What does, uh, for, for, 
uh, dynamic lighting <laughs> right there at work. <laughs> um, it's, it's running faster now. <laughs> <laughs> we just went up 20 frames per second. <laughs> Um, uh, so, so anyway, uh, what, what, what does kind of, uh, and, and a lot of that always happens right around the times of demos. You mentioned, you mentioned D3, QuakeCon was another one of those where for us, like the rubber really meets the road, certainly the last several months of the project. What was, what was kind of like a day like, uh, or a week like in, in the heat of that battle when you're kind of a, a backstop a, a lot for the, for the tech team and the team in general? Um, so it usually gets pretty crazy. Um, it's, it's hard for me because sometimes I don't know exactly what to do, but I, I know who can do it if I can't. But as a background, um, I got a BFA in animation, and then after I graduated, I got a job at ID as QA, and I got my foot in the door. And after that, I just started being really, really good at just narrowing down issues to like even lines of code and then I started working for Duffy and started digging in the systems and figuring things out myself. And then I kind of learned like general coding a little bit. And pretty much now, any time anybody has a problem, they come to me and I can figure it out. Almost everything. But again, if I can't, then Sometimes I Duffy it. comes to you because he doesn't know how to figure something out. Yeah. And you figure it out. That's true. That's true. <laughs> Um, so I actually want to talk a little bit about, uh, speaking of figuring things out, it's, it's, it's amazing. I want to talk about optimization because I don't, I don't know, uh, if you're a programmer, you probably, uh, understand the value of it, but, uh, um, I think it's an underrated part of development. Um, and, uh, I, I think people would, people would, I, if you're, if you're, if you're kind of wondering how things get to where they get from a frame rate perspective, um, it's a it's a it's a pretty important part of that. Um, but taking one step higher level than that, uh, it's it's it it still. I've been in the industry 20 years, and it still baffles me uh, the way s gaming software runs and how how complex it is and and how much is going on. Um, and and uh, Todd Todd Howard once had uh, uh, Guy Carver, who's the lead programmer at, at BGS, do a talk for their team about like what happens in a single frame of of the game. And when you think about that relative to watching a Pixar movie or something like that, and and you know a, a frame of a, a frame of that movie is rendered over the course of a day or, or something like that, and we're doing you know 60, 80, 90, 100 frames a second with the player in full control at not that less of a visual quality, if, if at all. Um, I, I thought maybe, again, you could do a whole talk on this one thing, but maybe, Billy, you could, you could kind of just explain kind of what happens in, in a, a game or rendering frame uh, for, for everybody. And then we can talk about how, how that runs fast. I have a short answer, way too much. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Um, yes, a lot. And um, I don't know if you guys can hear us. Um, we'll talk loud. Yes. Um, so we have you have the CPU, you have the GPU. Um, traditionally in NITTEC Five, what we had is we had a we had uh, on the CPU you would have two threads. You would have the the game logic running on one uh, on one thread, and then you have the render thread running on another one. And what that means is the you the game runs, the game logic runs, the AI logic runs, and so on and so on. And then you, after you know, after that's done, you then sync that with the render thread, and the render thread then draw, makes all the decides what needs to be displayed on the screen, and then you, then you, um, you know, present send that to the GPU. Um, but that's just a really high level view. We changed that around. We started we started thinking like we don't want to just do that with one thread. So we we broke it down into um, so that all the command buffers, what we call them, basically thinking of like recipes for different sections of things that need to be rendered. We started accumulating and, and generate them on the on, on jobs. So we have a bunch of asynchronously, a bunch of threads that create all these different little lists of things that need to be done. And then at the end, we then, in order, sent them to the GPU. And um, so if I were to break down one frame, you have things like, you know, you have to figure out what needs to be displayed. And you have, you know, what are the things that cast shadows? Um, then you have to like, what can we call? What can we? Uh, then we need to sort things. And what, the way we sort things is we start off by sorting them by render, by shaders. Render, we call them render progs in that software. 
and then we after that, then we uh, the next step of once the, once if you have something that's equal, same shader, then we make sure that it's done, you know, based on a um, uh, depth, and then we have another heuristic. So we have things sort in a certain way. So as things get occluded, then we don't pay the cost of rendering them. And the way we accomplish that, one of the ways we do that is obviously call them on the GPU, we call them on the CPU, but we do things like a like very common technique is we would do a pre-Z pass. Um, and that basically allows us to know um, all the all the pixels that that, um, that basically records where that pixel resides in the world in the Z value. Um, and what that allows us to do it allows um, the GPU to um, you know reject pixels that are not are obscured. That's one thing. There are, there are lots of other things. Um, Shadows have to be rendered, so we render, you know, meshes and surfaces from the from the viewpoint of the lights, and and create our shadow maps. Um, we and once you have that done, then you have to render opaque things, opaque things that you can't see through, and that's where all the magic happens. We have most of the surfaces that we have, uh, most of the meshes that we render are uh, opaque surfaces, like the world, and like you know, let's say I would model like this card or whatever. Um, and we have a unified shading model, and so we do all of our lighting and shading and you know decaling um, is all happening in this pass. So this has to be super fast. We use a clustered lighting approach, and you know Tiago worked on that. He can go to more depth about that later on. Um, but that's where most of the magic happens. We have an opaque pass where um, you know we we do. We do um, our shading, lighting, and, and the, the decals, come, traditionally we've done um, by baking them into something called a mega texture, but we now do them dynamically, and this happens all on the same pass. Uh, and then of course after that we have you know deferred passes for some of our special effects like you know SSDO, then we have SSR, which are screen space reflections. We have um, accumulation of, um, you know, we, of our probes, our light probes, and then, um, you know, we decouple, we, we, couple, we, we have a light atlas, so we can decouple lighting um, for our particles, for example. Um, but most importantly, as you look at all this stuff, there's so much stuff going on, and we have to make sure that we optimize that. So it's not only just optimizing, sending it to the GPU, we also have to micro-optimize each of the shaders and making sure that we don't constantly have tons of shaders. You want to unify that in as least amount of shaders as possible, so we can avoid contacts rolls. And um, uh, you know, worry about fill rate cost if you post processing steps. You know, with the places where we we have uh, where we where we tone map the PBR scene and so on and so on. So there's there's a ton of stuff going on. And um, one of the biggest gains we got was you know going asynchronous because we saved a, a ton of time on the CPU, and that way we could make sure the GPU was never stalling, and we made sure that um, you know the GPU is like always always busy, and that's it's almost like a jigsaw puzzle. It should, you you profile, you look at the C, and you're like, okay, well, there's a late, there's a gap there where nothing happens. How can we fill that gap? Uh, let's move this stuff around. And, and you keep iterating over and over. It's, it's trivializing some of the hard work we've done, but if you think about it, it's really just taking a bunch of pieces and trying to fill in the gaps. What are your thoughts? Uh, I mean, yeah, essentially that's that's about it. it. It's all also from a different perspective. It's like a, how you design the the solutions right. for, let's say, the shadows, for example. It's not just also just about rendering shadows. How do you make them fast? And not saying like. 20 milliseconds just running shadows and stuff like this. So right. actually, our shadows are fairly efficient. And some of the details in there, I mean, we try to cache things. So essentially, we don't like to repeat the work. Essentially, whenever you start repeating work every frame, there's a key, uh, kind of a hint in there that you are doing something stupid. Um, so in, there's a, OK, maybe this can be actually improved, the algorithm and the, the design of the things. Maybe we can decouple the costs, the frequency of the computations. Um, that applies to several things. So like, uh, for example, we were talking about the particles. Particles is a very good example of a performance hog in a video game. Uh, especially if you try to think about as we go higher and higher resolutions, uh, the amount of pixels we have to rasterize for particles, it's like goes insane the amount of computations that you have to do on a per pixel basis. So the solution there was, for example, on algorithmical side was, OK, how can we decouple the frequency of computation for the particle lightning? And, uh, if you look at particles, they generally look they look blurry in a sense. So why why are we doing this on a per pixel basis or on a on a different space? It's kind of, it's kind of stupid right. work. So 
So the idea there was, oh, maybe we can just render like one little pot per particle. And we just accumulate all of these lightning into a little atlas. And then we essentially are caching the results in there. Uh, so that we use this kind of stuff. And of course, that's a couple of orders of magnitude, and it's decoupled from screen resolution, and so on, and so on. Could you speak up? Uh, sorry. I'm sorry. Do we need I, to like, turn these back on or yeah, something? They're, they're working on it. OK. Uh, We'll, we'll cut Screw the bottoms me. out of these cups. And yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but essentially that's it's about the design of the things. Right. It's not just about the okay. We have to implement this. It's how you design it so that everything works properly and in an. I, I'm a, I'm not a fan of complexity. I like to keep things as simple as possible. Uh, so it's also about designing technology so that everything works nicely together in the end and not having oh we are doing something special for the opaque rasterization and something special for transparency and so on. So there's essentially we could could be here talking for one month <laughs> on <laughs> such kind of things. Uh, yeah. I mean if you guys want to learn more about such kind of stuff, we were at CGraph last last week. If you guys want to go super geeky, uh, we are talking about that kind of stuff. So so all of that kind of like two or three months before the game launches is 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 like it's it's a bunch of stuff that's kind of all right. been jammed together, and, and that's that is really where the optimization comes in. I don't. I, I think people don't talk about it often because it's like talking about you know your really messy house over the course of a dinner party. Everybody's like, oh, your house is beautiful. You see, should have seen it before you came. It looked like a you know <laughs> crap hole. But um, but uh, you know it, it it is really this kind of uh, from an outsider's perspective, somebody who who. Who is, isn't an engineer? It almost looks a little bit like magic when you guys are are running the running the tools. Um, you know, maybe talk a little. I mean, you and you and John were were right. kind of leading the charge on that stuff. Um, uh, maybe talk a little bit about how you approach that. How like because it is like it's like this. It seems from the outside like this big jigsaw puzzle that you kind of right. have to solve. Um, how, how do you approach it? What are the kind of tools that you that you use? What did you guys learn over the course of uh, of, of Going from you know something running much slower than it did once we once we launched. Um, well, it starts uh, first. You have to understand your problem before you can solve it. So I mean, we have awesome engineers. Like one of our engineers, Bosley, actually made a cool tool called Remo, and what that does is um, basically just captures and tracks the 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 milliseconds it takes for all the different pieces of the rendering pipeline, and then we made a little pretty graph, and then everybody that you know can look at that as people play through the game um, and it accumulates all that data and at the end of the, you know, we can have reports out and say, oh, you know, when we played Lazarus, you know, the frame rate tanked in this spot. Um, and you can track, you can really track if whether you're progressing. So that's a high level view. Everybody has a good understanding of what's happening. Um, uh, we even had a tool, the same tool basically broke it down to like, okay, this is happening in the game loop, this is happening on the rendering side of things, this is what the GPU is doing. And, and having those easy digestible graphs allowed everybody to speak the same language. So that's from a high level. From a, from a lower level, we, we basically just had to then analyze, we had to first give ourselves budgets, right? We want to spend this amount of time for shadows and this much of a time for post-processing and so on and so on. And since you only have like about 16.67 milliseconds for 60 hertz, um, we, we basically bucketized the amount of work we need to do into just time, amount of time we wanted to spend on those things uh, and how important they were. Um, and then we looked at whether there were latencies and what that means, little gaps like is the GPU always running at full speed? Is, is there something that is happening? Why is this stalling now? Like why is, is, is something on the, on the game side preventing or on the rendering on the CPU side preventing the GPU from progressing? And what you want to do is you, you basically fill those gaps. You want to reduce the latency. And the way you do that is you, um, you, have to, you have to have code that is very clean and very simple so you can shuffle things around. It's very important as a, as a programming team to have strict standards on, and this is like you know, philosophical again, but you have to have strict standards and you have a very, very, di uh, uh, very diligent programming team to make sure that the code stays clean so um, you don't over-engineer things. Uh, over engineering is a big problem with, uh, you know, oh, I don't want to, there's this thing on the internet where people are like, oh, I, need, I don't want to code, I want to make everything data driven and really what you need to do is you need to solve the problem you have at hand because later on we need to add something, you just add that extra thing because the more, the more over engineered it is, the harder it is for us to rip apart and then make faster. So um, it starts at the top with, you know, 
having a very, very diligent programming team, having strict standards, but then also giving yourself budgets, having awesome tools. And then you just have to look at the, from an, arc, from a, from an algorithmic standpoint, like Tiago was saying, you have to see like, what are the problem sets? What's the game need? We need a lot of, pro in Doom, we need tons of particles. So we looked at, like Tiago described, we looked at how can we reduce the cost on, on, on overdraw, how, we can, how can we make them still lit, like, uh, and, 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 and still have them look awesome without having sacrifice, you know, for sacrificing speed. So um, you start off algorithmically, once you exhaust all those, all those avenues, because you either run out of time or uh, they, is those, uh, or the um, or there aren't any better solutions or you haven't come up with that then you start um, thinking you, you take the problem set and you sit it on the side you you basically say like what if I you know what if I break it down over multiple frames and that's what you know Tiago was also mentioned where we where we do things over where we temporarily accumulate things over you know data across multiple frames and then break down the problem set that way and then you know for the current frame we use some data from the previous frame um, um, it's 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 a very fun task. Um, it's you know profile and profile. It's you you take a capture of what the of the you basically play the game. You get a scene that's low. You take a capture, and then you see we can see exactly in, in the profiling tools that you have on the consoles or even on the PC with render doc. You can see um, exactly what the what the graphic cards are doing, and. Um, Oh, we're back. Yay. And you will see. Thank you. Yay. Tech guys. <laughs> um, you, um, you, have to, you have to really make sure that you um, spend your time wisely. Because it, it, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you optimize something, the only way you know that is by profiling, gathering data, evaluating, and then testing making sure that whatever you did is actually making forward momentum because like many times you make a change and and and, and some sometimes if you don't have the proper data you, you have to prove that what you did actually made it faster especially when you when you talk about something that happens asynchronously because you could make a, a change in a job or you can shuffle jobs around and you actually introduce bubbles or latencies that could slow things down so it is um, it is something that just takes diligence and a lot of understanding from the artists. <laughs> and then when all else fails, we use what we call duff tape. Which yes, is <laughs> Duffy comes in like a ninja. After Robert Duffy. Um, <laughs> he, 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 Robert's been at the company a long time and he just, uh, like, it's crazy sometimes, the, 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 <laughs> the holes that get patched by duff tape. Um, uh, but, but actually, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of a, a natural, talking about optimization and, uh, and that stuff, it's a, it's a good progression as, as we also talk about Vulkan. Um, hopefully, everybody played Vulkan, you like, like the results. Uh, we, were, we were one of the first, um, and uh, hope you're enjoying the benefits of that. Uh, for, for anybody who doesn't know, or I've, I've actually had people ask me in interviews, um, like, I, I don't get a very good ex explanation about what Vulcan is. I hear it, it's a cool word, but I really don't, don't know. Um, that's, that's people in the press as well um, that, have, that have asked that. Uh, Robert, I mean, just even for the people who are watching on the stream, what is the, the most important thing for us is consumer benefit. So what, what do you, like, break it down just from a consumer benefit to start. I, I mean, I've described Vulcan a couple of times uh, at the NVIDIA event and a few other places. It's, it's, it, I mean, you can look at it like a spiritual successor to OpenGL, but it's definitely not OpenGL. Um, you know, it's a modern graphics API. Uh, to consumers, it means you're going to get a better experience from the game. And, you know, and that's, that's really why we decided to, to do it. And we decided really late in the project. Like, yeah. We yes. six, eight weeks from ship. <laughs> I, I told Marty, I was like, hey, I think we're going to go ahead and, and, and go for Vulcan. And he was like, are you insane? And, um, you know, but he understood the benefits. And I said, okay. And, and he said, okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, that was the second thing out of his mouth. Uh, uh, and, you know, it pioneered the use of, of, of OpenGL for gaming back in the 90s, and I really thought it would be... I, I thought it had merit for us to, to pioneer this again uh, with this new API and, re and really go for it. And um, you know, I, I didn't do any of the work. I just, I just. <laughs> so you know, I still actively code, but I mostly do things like I'm, I'm good at shipping. You know, at the, at the end, and and do the the non glamorous resource management type type stuff. Um, yeah. But. 
uh, Axel had uh, had had gotten us up kind of to console rendering, not not PS4, Xbox console, but uh, our console rendering, maybe late last year. And uh, he and Billy were talking about it, and I came in on a Monday, and Axel goes, oh, "I know." I talked to Billy. He said, "You don't want to do it. It's too much work." I was like, "No." I had some wine last night and was thinking, <laughs> "Hey, we pioneered OpenGL. Let's do it again." <laughs> and uh, and then it was a mad dash by by Axel, Billy, and all the guys to to, to get it in, and and the results the results are fantastic. Yeah. We, we, we got a chance to show show it off at an NVIDIA event and, and also an AMD event. Uh, and, and, man, looking at it on that Polaris card was just like Yeah, 200 awesome. frames or, or, or the 1080. Yeah, I mean, when we took, went down to Austin and showed it on the 1080. Um, maybe, like, outside of, obviously, the frame rates, which, which everybody benefits from on Doom, um, you know, what, what are some of the other... Uh, Benefits of Vulcan, I know uh, VR is, is is definitely. I mean, it's a it's a it's a big pe part part of that. But uh, you know, to have ability, what do you what do you guys feel like outside of just the, the frame rates? Are there are there architectural benefits, uh, coding benefits that, that you feel uh, really make it a, a, a kind of a, a strong successor for for how we move the tech forward? I mean. Again, it all goes down again to this uh, decoupling of costs, the frequency of costs of what you are doing on a per frame basis. So the old style APIs, for example, OpenGL or the X11 and below. So it's, if you, okay, I'm trying to explain it simply, so uh, bear with me. So you can think of it as, uh, okay, we are preparing to render these objects. Uh, we set up some render states, as we call it. Uh, we set up textures, et cetera, et cetera. And then on the next frame, you do exactly the same thing, and that's completely stupid. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that is really okay. Are we okay? We can. We know already all of the states. Why are we redoing this right. over and over again? We can just pre-compile all of that state management stuff and uh, reuse all of that stuff. So there's, it's a lot of design smartness uh, in a sense uh, to mitigate all of the CPU side costs uh, in a way. Um, if I were to describe it as like. Think of a sandwich. I used your analogy earlier when that person asked me. I'm like, think of a sandwich. <laughs> right. I came up with this now. This so is an analogy. So. so you have a sandwich, it's like a hamburger, right? And the bottom you have like the OS, and then the, the middle part is huge, and that's your driver. That's what we used to have on the, on the PC side. And then on the top is like, you know, your really thin engine. Um, on, the, on other platforms like the consoles, that, that thing in the middle is much thinner. And Vulcan allows you to get much, get that driver thing out of the way. You want to get closer to the hardware, you want to get closer to, to get beyond the, what the operating system wants to do. So um, by removing that thick, thick driver layer or flattening it out and putting some of that ownership into the application or the game, um, the, it, it, it empowers the, 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 the team to just code exactly to what the, the capabilities do the hardware. And because uh, the driver has to work for most other titles. And a driver team may not know exactly what the intent of the application is. So by giving that responsibility to the, to the, in, to the, to the application or the engine of the, of the game developer, since we know what we're trying to accomplish, we can exactly tell the GPU what it needs to do rather than the driver has to like, oh, I need to now, I don't know what they actually want to do, but I think what they need to do. And then you have all this branchy, slow code that goes in there and has to um, make assumptions rather than, you know, so the driver layer really slows down the CPU. You can't submit work to the GPU fast enough. So Vulcan removes that and puts ownership to the to the game developers and that's that's awesome because it allows us to really code as, as you guys would say code to the metal and um, allows us to really take advantage of the hardware to uh, that's available on the PC which you know the, the PC has awesome hardware we want to be actually make good use of that um, and Vulcan also has the extensibility factor that we that OpenGL pioneered it allows us to to request features that the, as new hardware comes out and immediately use them or we can even say like you know I want we really think that this software thing is great can you guys do the new NVIDIA guys and the AMD can you can you implement this feature and give us this information or allow us to do this specific thing and then they can expose it to us and then we can immediately take it take advantage of that um, which allows us to have that really close relationship with our partners um, yeah and it allows us to really push the envelope and making use of the hardware again. So having extensibility is great. That's something that was brought forward from OpenGL. 
Um, the, the one other thing is like it's cross-platform. If you are a developer and you want to make a, a title, um, if you support Vulkan, you know it will work on mobile platforms because it was designed with mobile in hand. It also works on all Windows platforms, and um, and you know that it's going to be uh, it's going to be brutally fast because you because again you you're working you're working towards one API rather than having to fragment yourself and having support multiple APIs. You can focus on what's important, which is the title. Um, so going forward, we hope that more developers. And embrace this because I think it's uh, I think it's uh, better for the industry and for gamers as a whole. Um, but from the end consumer's point of view, you just get faster games. I mean, literally more stable games, and that's what we all want, right? You want more stable games, faster games, more exquisite games, and then really make usage of the hardware. Um, I want to give some shout out to some of our friends and our partners that really made this happen. I think. Uh, you know, at Nvidia, Matthias Schott and 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 Jean Petelier and you know um, Jeff Boltz and um, you know Eric Reitley on the Nvidia side, and then on an the AMD side, I want to say you know thank you to Timothy Lotz and um, you know Graham Sellers and Neil Monday who have really um, helped us on the driver side. Because since we were one of the first AAA titles to use Vulkan, we we ran we used the API to almost to exactly how it was supposed to be used, and we encountered things, and they helped us work through those issues, and that's why we were able to achieve those really high frame rates now that you guys can enjoy. It, it was funny. We had we had moments towards the end of the development where we actually had. Uh, our engineers and AMD and Nvidia right. all like in the same office. We were kind of like, this is this is weird. You right. actually tweeted out a picture of everybody at lunch together. It was like it was I like the UN. Have to say, <laughs> in, <laughs> I have to say, like in 15 years, I never see that kind of stuff right. happening yeah. before. So it was kind of quite cool. It was, it was awesome. Yeah, really, really cool. And thanks to thanks to them again. Um, I, I do want to reserve like the last 10 minutes or so for anybody who has any questions. Um, so if uh, we're, we've got just a couple minutes, I'll, I'll, I have another thing I want to talk about. But if you have a question, maybe like come like line up along that wall or in the middle aisle or something uh, and we'll, we'll get to you right after this. Um, I, I mentioned Vulcan, is it related to, uh, to VR? How many, has anybody gotten a chance to try the VR stuff over uh, Doom VR? Okay, a few of you. Awesome. If if uh, if you haven't, I would definitely stop by and try it. If you know, it's it's uh, it's crazy to have played Doom and then step into a VR experience and see that that stuff like right in front of you. Uh, you know, as as Robert mentioned, uh, Shale's been working heavily on it with a with a small team over the course of of a while here, and, and Robert's been heading it up. Um, you know, m maybe you guys could just uh, tell us a little bit about um, why. You know why it's such a natural progression for the tech and the game, um, and and some of the, talk a little bit about some of the changes even that, that have had to go into uh, making that transition and and uh, and kind of where we're headed. Uh, yeah, the um, IdTech Six I think is uniquely set up, for, uh, uniquely prepared for VR because it is so fast and um, you know, not, kind of ninety hertz is the minimum entry point for a good VR experience and. Um, so having the technology base that we have uh, puts us in a really good position for that. Uh, we had, you know, introduced modern VR in, in 2012 uh, with the Doom 3 BFG uh, demo, and uh, I, I look at this these next steps as, as evolutions um, uh, of that technology and evolutions of our brands. I think Doom is particularly well suited as a, as a brand, just because I love Doom, <laughs> and uh, you know, being the Doom Marine might not necessarily be the best you know angle for VR. Um, although we're working on, on 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 figuring that out, but what we're working on right now is really game design principles that we can apply to not only Doom but other Bethesda brands over time, and try to figure out what how do we build compelling worlds that can can sit alongside the first person shooter experiences and and really. You know, showcase the UAC, showcase the Doom World, um, showcase Fallout and Skyrim and everything like that, and and, and just look at our at our brands from a company. Well, yeah, you, Shale, you've you've kind of you and Mark, another one of our programmers, you guys have been doing a ton of work on it. It's a good example of where you know, kind of a programmer and and a technical specialist get to even participate in the design of something. What are the th what are some of the things that you that you feel like uh, we've had to we've really had to to change from a 
uh, or, or even like I, I played the VR experience here uh, and and uh, had played it at, at E3, and you guys had evolved it quite a bit even even since then. You know, what 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 are some of those things that that are that are really pushing it to to make it more and more fun every day? Um, well, a lot of the things are just I I get with Mark the programmer and. We just talk about what we could do to make it better, and we just try things, and we keep trying them, keep trying them, and basically when we find something that kind of works, I'll either he or I will think of something that would make it cool, and we just try that too, and it's been really a whole lot of like trial and error. Like yeah. a, a bunch of the stuff we've tried, it doesn't work, and particularly to movement, it's I hear a lot of, oh, I don't like teleportation, but I've tried the D-pad movement. I've tried moving like in other ways. It, it doesn't work um, in, in my opinion. Um, I, like, I don't get dizzy when I'm wearing the VR headset, but I get dizzy when I use the other movement things we've implemented. So we just went back to the other, the teleportation, for instance. Yeah, the cool thing, they added uh, one of the cool little uh, additions is uh, slow-mo when you teleport. You guys you guys did that and it's 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 totally awesome. Yeah. I think iteration is key yeah. for all yeah. of this stuff. It's just we go through so many things that fail. For sure. Yeah. And, fail fast. Yeah. That's, fail fast. that's a good motto. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, we got about nine minutes left. Uh, we'll kind of try and get through as many questions as we can. I'll try to speak loudly so everybody can hear me. Um, you had mentioned the extensibility of Vulcan. Uh, I have a G C monitor and I noticed that when I run Vulcan it doesn't take advantage of the variable frame rate. I don't know any much back end of Vulcan API or how NVIDIA GC works, but do you know if it's possible that it'll get it working in the future? Yeah, we, there are some, there are some little tweaks we still have to make. There are some tweaks that have to be done on the driver's side as well. Um, we are currently working through those issues, and you know there will be an update as soon as we have it ready. Thanks for all your work. So, we, oh, thank you. I forgot to say, we'll, we'll try and repeat the question. Oh, I'm we, sorry. Yeah, it's, okay. We, it's, it's okay. It's uh, okay. So, yeah, we, we've got a stream going, so we'll try and repeat the question when we answer it. Hey, folks. Uh, thanks for doing the panel. Um, my question is, uh, historically and traditionally, its software has tried to, whenever possible, write as much of their engine in-house, uh, trying to do all the solutions themselves. Um, if you look at the source code from id tech 1 all the way through id tech 4 I mean, everything is done um, the id way rather than outsourcing it to a third party or something like that. I can't speak to id tech 5 because obviously the source code isn't out there, but maybe you folks can speak to id tech 6. Um, firing up Doom when the logos and the legal mumbo jumbo is coming out, one thing sticks out, using Umbra for visibility. Um, maybe you can speak to that, what Umbra is used for in in Tech 6, why it chose to go with a third party solution for visibility versus implementing it in house as in previous engines. I can speak uh, specifically to the to the adoption of some, some additional third party uh, libraries. We also use um, WIs for audio, uh, and uh, these were very deliberate decisions. Um, the Effectively, on, from an audio perspective, WIs allow us to put most of the sound creation, well, all the sound creation, obviously, but most of the sound design and problems that go along with maintaining an audio engine internally, uh, we move all that work and, onto the sound designers. And, so, and they have a really good authoring tool, like world-class authoring tool that they can now build, build soundscapes with. And... Uh, Umbra is used for occ for occlusion, and we needed a solution that was fast enough. We wanted to remove a frame of latency from our occlusion system, and that was one of the primary reasons to go with Umbra. And there's still a lot of work on our side in both cases to get these integrated. But these were choices of of, of really time and effort. We could we can we certainly have the the people and and, and the. the the uh, the backgrounds to, to write a new occlusion system, but you know for a relatively low cost we can integrate something third party. We can work with a partner and really get results much faster and really focus. Again, Doom is about the game design and about the player, and we really wanted to focus as much effort as we could on on the game itself versus just necessarily owning the technology to own it. Uh, you know, we're still probably 90% uh, 
you know, all pure ID code, but we, we, we've made some what I consider to be intelligent choices on, on adopting certain third party uh, libraries. All right, cool. thanks. Thank you. Hey, no. um, I was playing Doom last night and I was just running around, jumping around, just being very weird in the game. I wasn't playing it like it was supposed to be played. Like a buddy of mine was looking over, he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm just enjoying the engine. <laughs> I love the id tech engine. I love it. It's, it's a masterpiece and it feels great to play. That said, when are we going to be able to just jump direct, like launch Doom into multiplayer? Is that possible? Do we have to jump into the main console and switch over to multiplayer? No, what's, and maybe if not, like, how was the story on that? You want to take that again? I can. <laughs> I don't take it that, that was all me. Yeah, no, me. <laughs> <laughs> the, the basic reasons on, on, on that particular choice on having to, boot, to, to, to reboot into reboot the game into each mode is effectively uh, was memory uh, mainly largely memory driven uh, and uh, we also wanted to stay the same on all platforms. Technically, uh, it's technically possible for us on a PC to, to have all three modes available. Uh, it, it was just, it was going to be a, a good bit of additional work. Uh, for the future, we're going to probably do a shell that will we'll, we'll just we'll load a DLL and things like that because we're doing DLL separation and some other things uh, uh, for, for whatever we're gonna, going to work on next. But those were conscious choices basically all centered on, on memory pressure because SnapMap, as an example, has a much bigger memory footprint because you have to have the editor loaded, you have to have all the assets loaded, and some of those, some of those choices were, were, were just for that. So I don't like it either, but. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so you guys have talked quite a bit about the benefits of Vulkan. Um, I was wondering, historically, the GPU manufacturers have put a lot of effort into game-specific optimizations of their drivers. Uh, either fast paths for the way in which the games use the APIs or optimizations to work around weaknesses or get benefits from newer architectures. Uh, will they still have some of that freedom in Vulkan or is it all on the game developers now to optimize for particular hardware? Um. There are still many things they can do on their end uh, because as you, as you mentioned yourself. So the question was like, if we use Vulkan, will, will the IHV still um, you know, be able to have custom drivers that will be spe uh, have offer optimizations for specific games? And the need for that is actually you know, reduced because the developer will have full control over stuff. And the need is reduced because we can tell the GPU exactly what needs to happen. So then, and um, the G, like Tiago mentioned, sorry, the way Tiago mentioned is like it, it's a smarter approach because we don't have to replicate that same work every frame. Um, but on the back end, some of the architectural choices that the, that the hardware manufacturers are making, some of those are, are not accessible to us. So there will be some work on how they deal with memory, how they deal with the caches, how they move textures in and out, um, how they. Um, how they use some of their caches, for example, there is still some work that they can do, and it's quite significant, actually, um, because, um, but, again, Vulcan actually makes that easier for them, because they will know exactly what our intent is, and if they know the exact intent, um, then they can even do better optimizations. So going forward, I would say the drivers will be even better. So don't, don't worry, you will have plenty of good stuff to look forward to. I actually also have like a two-part question about Vulkan. So the first part is, were there any new kind of technical issues or problems that came up with Vulkan versus what you're used to doing previously? And then second, the fact that you guys have more control over what the GPU is doing, taking away the, the learning curve, would you consider Vulkan to increase or decrease or, or make no difference in your development? Um, I can talk about that. So the question was, like, will, it, will Vulcan increase our development time? And the second portion was like, you know, is, is the, I mean, the learning curve part of it. Well, like, were there any unique issues? Oh, the unique issues, issues, yes. Uh, yes, we encountered lots of unique issues, and it usually came down with GPUs that had um, low memory consumption. And the way, the way you have to handle memory in Vulcan is slightly different. Uh, the, the, we have to do the work. Um, 
on our end now, whereas with the driver used to do that. Um, there is some learning curve there, but that's something you can overcome. There will be um, the IHVs were very handy in, in, in providing solutions to help with their particular hardware, um, but rethinking the way you deal with textures and how you use textures is critical. Um, I think in the long run it will make our life easier because um, the, you won't have to worry actually about supporting so many different APIs. Ideally, some of the other partners we have will come to their senses and use Vulkan for their new platforms as well, um, especially as we, as, as we um, want to maybe branch out and make another title so all, all these new platforms are coming out. So I think in the long run, having Vulkan will actually just make our development cycle go down um, because we, not, we, don't, we don't have that latency between like, oh, the driver broke, we have to fix this, driver broke, fix it. We actually have more control. We'll, we'll make this last one quick, so okay. thank you. So with your rendering equation that you're using, are you using um, per fragment lining across the board and also are you using ambient occlusion filtering in it? Uh, or amb ambient occlusion lining? So the question is about the lightning equation, what we are doing for the lightning in a sense. That's a uh, I mean, that's a huge topic. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll try to s summarize it a little bit. Um, Okay, so the engine itself, it's an an hybrid solution and of several lightning solutions of approximations of what runs fast for certain things. We try to keep it as unified as possible across different types of surfaces. So if it's an opaque surface, if it's a transparent surface, uh, all of that goes through the exact same pipeline. And then there's certain types of, okay, we still are not able to do real-time global elimination super efficiently at uh, uh, 60 yards. Um, I think it's next door. This, this yeah, maybe some weird sounds. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think they have a campfire. So, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so essentially, we have to resort to um, pre-computing some of the data, of course, um, and that includes, for example, some of the reflections that you might see in the game. It's an hybrid again of okay, we can pre-compute some of the reflection data that we have, uh, but we can also merge it with the dynamic uh, reflections so that we have, so that we might see on the game. And I mean, this is the usual approach for several things. And then there's certain cases that if it runs super, super slow, of course we have to, we have to come up with something creative. So that was uh, the particles solution, for example. And that's about it. I mean, there, of course, there's we do some specular occlusion, some angular occlusion, and all of that. It's kind of re a requirement these days. If you are doing physical based rendering, you cannot just have reflections everywhere and have everything looking super shiny. You have to do some. There's a lot of mathematical foundation. Uh, uh, we we spoke a little bit about this on uh, on Cipher, uh, not in super in-depth detail as I would have liked to, but uh, there's some information there. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you to our panelists, Robert, Shiel, Billy, and Tiago, and and thank you so much for uh, coming to QuakeCon and again uh, coming to our our panel today. Uh, and thank and, you for and, playing and Doom. And buying Doom. Yes. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Thank you.